I'm Dr. David Clark. The title of this podcast is Theology and Identity. Our aim is to explore the interaction between the way we understand God and the way we understand ourselves. In our first series, we're exploring the texts of the Old Testament to see how they reveal the character of Yahweh and the identity of his chosen people Israel. We're working our way through the Old Testament utilizing the analytical framework of narrative theology. What this means is that we are reading the Old Testament as a story. We're looking at how the character of Yahweh is developed through the text, how the people of Israel struggle to find their identity, and how the relationship between Yahweh and his people progresses. In our first podcast, we looked at the promise that God had given to Abraham. In Genesis chapters 12 and 22, God said to Abraham, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. I will make you a great nation, and through your seed will all the nations of the earth be blessed. We've noted that this is the central storyline of the entire Old Testament. The driving question of the Hebrew Scriptures is, how will God fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham? One of our first tasks was to identify the meaning of the word blessing. To determine this, we looked at the first 11 chapters of Genesis as they portray the fall of humanity and give us a glimpse of the consequences of sin. We saw there that sin results in separation. It separates us from God, it separates us from one another, and it leads to a broken, disjointed relationship with the physical creation. So if the consequences of sin is separation, the blessing that comes to humanity through the seed of Abraham will be restoration restoration in our relationship with God, in our relationships with one another, and a restored relationship with the earth. This is the gift of God to humanity through the seed of Abraham. In our second podcast, we explored specifically how this will happen. We've noted that before Israel can be a blessing to the nations, they must first receive the blessing from God. They are given the gift of love relationship with Yahweh by grace. They then make a covenant with God as a means of abiding in this relationship. This covenant consisted of four pillars, monotheism, election, Torah, and tabernacle. Israel must worship Yahweh and Yahweh alone, loving him with all of their heart and all of their soul and all of their strength. They must embrace their identity as the chosen people of God. Israel, the seed of Abraham, is the one and only nation with whom Yahweh has made a covenant. And they are the one and only nation through whom blessing will reach the nations. So they must understand that a lot is riding on them. Third, they must keep God's commands. 613 laws show them the way of life. And finally, they must preserve the sanctity of the tabernacle. The tabernacle is important because this is where sacrifices are made for the atonement of Israel. Even when the people of Israel sin and make mistakes, through the sacrificial system they have forgiveness of sin. So these are the four pillars of the covenant, monotheism, election, Torah, and tabernacle. We remember that faithfulness to the covenant first and foremost is relational. It's the means by which Israel preserves and maintains their relationship with Yahweh. This is how the first part of the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled. Israel receives and preserves the blessing of relationship with God. We also noted in our last podcast that there is a missional element in the promise made to Abraham. Israel will be blessed and they will be a blessing to the nations. This happens primarily through the example that they give. As they honor the terms of the covenant, they thrive and prosper. As they follow the law, they will be happy and healthy and prosperous. They will live in peace with one another. There will be justice for the poor and care and compassion for all. And all of this prosperity will not go unnoticed. The nations around Israel will see how they love God, how they love one another, and this testimony will draw all nations to Jerusalem. The nations around Israel will say, we want to be like you. Teach us the ways of your God so that we also can worship him. So the vision here is that Israel is an example to the nations. They are a model people. They are a light shining on a hill that draws all humanity to themselves. As the first five books of the Old Testament come to an end, we the readers are very hopeful. 
We believe that Israel has the ability to take possession of the land that God has promised them, and they have the ability to become a model people. As we then read through the book of Joshua, we feel encouraged. Joshua is a strong leader with a clear vision. In chapter 1, we see that God affirms the promise that he had first given to Moses, saying to Joshua, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Then follows the accounts of great victories and successes that Israel enjoyed under Joshua's leadership. Of course, some mistakes were made along the way, but for the most part, the twelve tribes got off to a good start in the land that God had promised to them. But as the life of Joshua comes to an end, the task is still not completed. Just before he died, he gathered the leaders of the twelve tribes together at Shechem, and there they renewed the covenant. In chapter 24, he said to the people, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. After Joshua died, the men of his generation continued to provide strong leadership for the twelve tribes. We read in Joshua 24, 31, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. But as we come into the book of Judges, this is where everything starts to go wrong. The twelve tribes start fighting against one another, and they fail to take possession of the land that God had promised them. But even more tragically, they turned away from worshiping God. In Judges 2 it says, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods, from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. So we come into what was really the darkest and strangest period in the history of the Twelve Tribes. Very weird things happen in this book. There was a leader named Jephthah, the son of a prostitute, who tragically sacrificed his own daughter to fulfill a foolish vow that he made to God. We have the story of Samson, who was set apart from birth to be a deliverer for the people of Israel. He had incredible strength, but he also had an unfortunate tendency to go after prostitutes and women that did not worship the God of Israel. We have the story of a man named Micah, who turned his house into a mini temple, complete with silver images of Yahweh and even a Levite priest. And in chapter 19, we come to the strangest story of all. Traveling through the territory of Benjamin, a Levite and his concubine stop for a night in a town called Gibeah. Staying as the guest in the house of an old man, something very similar to the experience that Lot had in Sodom takes place. The house is surrounded by wicked men of the city who demand that the Levite be turned over to them so that they may quote-unquote know him. In order to appease the mob, the Levite sends out his concubine. The very disturbing account says that these men abused her all through the night, and the next morning when the Levite went out, he found her dead on the doorstep. And then he did something very strange. He cut her body into twelve pieces and sent a piece to each of the twelve tribes of Israel. It was a grotesque gesture, and it provoked a civil war, as the eleven other tribes went to battle against Benjamin over what had happened in Gibeah. 
What we note in this passage is that these violent men of Gibeah who wanted to rape the Levite and then actually raped and murdered his concubine were not quote-unquote pagans. They were Israelites from the tribe of Benjamin. So the author of Judges is painting a very interesting picture here. He's saying that Israel is becoming like Sodom. The people of Israel are losing their humanity, and if something doesn't change, the nation will descend into utter chaos. So looking back over all of these horror stories from the book of Judges, we ask, what was going on with the people of Israel at this time? Leaders sleeping with prostitutes and sacrificing their children, families casting silver images of Yahweh and setting up mini temples in their homes, violent mobs raping women and men, dismembering dead bodies, civil war. Israel is hardly acting as the model people that they were called to be. Is there any hope that the nation can get back on track? It would seem that the answer from the text is yes and no. Every time things would get really bad, they would cry out to God for mercy. He would deliver them, but then, of course, they would return to their old ways. So how did Yahweh feel about this constant process of going back and forth? Judges 10 offers some amazing insights into the character of Israel's God. It says, And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you, because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, Did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the Ammonites and from the Philistines? Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. So the question that I want to explore is this. What was going on in the heart of the people at this time? God had done so much for them, and yet they found it so difficult to remain faithful. From a theological perspective, what was the problem? Some theologians would, of course, argue that the problem was human depravity. The human heart is so corrupt, the people of Israel didn't have the ability to remain faithful to the covenant. They didn't have the ability to worship Yahweh alone, and they didn't have the ability to be a model people. But the problem I have with this particular theological interpretation is that it involves reading the text through a hermeneutical lens that wasn't developed until much later in history. When we approach the Old Testament as a narrative, we try to enter into the moment. We don't want to superimpose our modern theological presuppositions. We try to work only within the framework that the text itself has given us up until this point. In this light, everything we've seen in the text show that Yahweh does in fact believe that covenant faithfulness is possible, and his plan for the nations is riding on this. He has given Israel everything they need to succeed, and his sincere hope is that they will succeed. Why would he even bother making a covenant with Israel if he thought that they had no ability to keep it? In my view, God has made a covenant with Israel because he genuinely believes that they have the ability to be faithful. This doesn't mean that he expects them to be perfect, and that's why he instituted the sacrifices of the temple. He doesn't expect them to be perfect, but he does call them to be faithful. So once again, for me, the total depravity approach doesn't work here. I think something else is going on, and I think the root issue is really a crisis of identity. Let's focus on a particular character in this book of Judges whose story will help illuminate this point. We turn to the figure of Gideon, beginning in chapter 6. Gideon was a young man during one of those seasons when everything was going wrong for Israel. The text says that because of their unfaithfulness, God had given them over to the hand of the Midianites for seven years. The Israelites would plant crops, but the Midianites would descend from the hills on their camels and they would trample the fields and burn their homes and kill their animals, leaving them with nothing. And so the people of Israel moved into caves and mountain strongholds in order to hide. The people of Israel then cried out to God for mercy, and God chose Gideon as the one who would lead them in defeating their enemies. 
Now, Gideon was perhaps more brave than some of his fellow Israelites. Rather than running off to live in a cave, he stayed at home and he tried to bring in the harvest. The account in Judges 6 says that Gideon was threshing wheat inside of a wine press. Now, anyone familiar with ancient farming techniques knows that the way to thresh wheat is to pile it up on a slab located in an open area. As the harvester beats the wheat, he throws it into the air, and the wind carries off the chaff. This is called winnowing. And in the end, only the heavier grain remains on the threshing floor. The problem with this technique is that when you thresh in an open area, that cloud of chaff and dust can be seen from far away. Had Gideon done this, the Midianites would have seen him from afar. And so to hide from them, Gideon is trying to thresh his wheat inside of a wine press. Now I imagine that hidden in an enclosed area, there would be no wind to carry off the chaff. So it may very well be that Gideon was doing an exercise in futility. But the least that can be said about him is that he was trying. As he was threshing the wheat, the text says that a messenger, which is the Hebrew word malak, came and sat under a tree and watched him in this foolish exercise. And then the messenger speaks to him, saying, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, of course, this is a very strange greeting. From the text itself, there's no indication that Gideon had ever done anything worthy of note, that he had ever won any battles or exercised any kind of leadership over anyone else, So it seems strange that the messenger of the Lord would call him a mighty man of valor and say, the Lord is with you. In response, Gideon challenges the messenger. The first point he wishes to contest is that God is with him. In Judges 6.13, Gideon says, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. It becomes very clear that Gideon does not believe that God is with him or with his people. But the messenger doesn't give up. And as we read through the narrative, we discover that this is no ordinary messenger. In 6.14 it says, And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? The man speaking to Gideon is Yahweh himself appearing in human form. But Gideon is still not convinced. And he has a very clear explanation as to why he is unable to be a leader for the tribes of Israel. In 6.5, he says, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Let's unpack a little bit what Gideon is saying. Manasseh is a small tribe, perhaps the smallest of the twelve. And within Manasseh, Gideon's clan is the weakest. And then within Gideon's family, he says he is the youngest. And so what he is saying is, I am the smallest of the smallest of the small. In other words, I'm a nobody. But God does not give up. It would seem that God sees something in Gideon that Gideon does not see in himself. Gideon sees himself as a nobody, and God sees him as a mighty man of valor. Gideon sees himself as someone who has been abandoned by God, and God sees him as someone who has inner strength and the ability to lead. God sees in Gideon amazing potential, and God's calling for Gideon is not limited by Gideon's weaknesses and failures. God calls Gideon because he sees all that Gideon has the potential to become. In verse 16, it says, And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. So when Gideon finally does decide to obey, God's vision for Gideon is fulfilled. In his first major battle, Gideon confronts the Midianites The text of chapter 7 says that the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east had gathered along the valley like locusts in abundance and camels without number, like the sand that is on the seashore. Gideon faced this multitude with just 300 men, and he defeated them. Now let's step back a bit from this narrative. As we look at the story of Gideon, I want to know in what ways he might be representative of leadership in Israel at this time. In what ways might the struggles and the doubts of Gideon symbolize the doubts and the struggles of the entire nation? 
I believe that through the story of Gideon, the book of Judges is pointing us to a bigger problem in Israel. Was it a lack of leadership? The author of Judges reminds the reader numerous times throughout the text that there was no king in Israel during these days. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But that seems to be an oversimplification. We don't have to read too far ahead in the narrative to discover that even when the people of Israel did have a king, it really didn't make that much of a difference. What if the real problem is that the people of Israel have lost track of their identity? It seems to me that the people of Israel had lost their understanding of what it means to be the chosen people of God. They lost a clear sense of their purpose and calling. The root cause of their failures was self-doubt and insecurity. From their own creation stories, they knew that they had been created in God's image. They knew that they were the seed of Abraham. They knew that God had made a covenant with their fathers in the wilderness. Had they just stood in their identity as the chosen people of God, capable of living in covenant faithfulness, and called to be a model people to the nations, perhaps they would not have failed so dismally. And so let's bring these questions that emanate from the text into the 21st century. Our question on theology and identity is this. Could it be that God sees something in people that they have never seen in themselves? Could it be that God speaks over the lives of individuals and communities, words of hope and affirmation and great potential? And could it be that the struggle of Gideon and the people of Israel is the same struggle that people of faith face today? The text challenges us to ask, who are we listening to? Are we listening to the voice of inner doubt and insecurity? Are we listening to the voices of the world that say, you're a failure, you're not good enough, and that your life will never amount to anything? Or are we listening to the voice of our Creator, the one who made us and loves us and calls us to something better? And with that thought, we'll conclude our reflection on the book of Judges. In our next podcast, we will look at the rise of the monarchy in Israel. God eventually did give the people of Israel a king, and we want to know if this was really the answer to their problems. Did the kings of Israel and Judah lead the people into covenant faithfulness, or did these problems of doubt and insecurity and faithlessness persist? I'm Dr. David Clark. I lecture at the University of Roehampton in southwest London, I can be reached at david.clark, that's C-L-A-R-K, at rowhampton.ac.uk. I hope that you will join me next time in this podcast, Theology and Identity.